Hello, and welcome back to our new series, Highlights from the Hill. Uh, welcome back, Dr. McLeod. It's great to be back here. Thanks. And it's a wonderful opportunity to highlight the things that are happening in the school department. Um, current, both current events and future events. Yes, and you know, the, I mean, the first show came out really, really well, and it's gotten good traffic on the website. Oh, that's and great. Good comments, good feedback coming back. So oh, good to I'm know. really excited to be part of it. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, so let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. Right, so today we're going to talk about an update on the fields. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have two guests, well, three actually. Uh -huh. um, Dr. Carol Cavanaugh, who is our assistant superintendent, our new assistant superintendent, is here. I'm just delighted to introduce her to everybody. And we're going to have a, a chat about all the wonderful things that are going on in her world. Um, and then we're going to have a visit from Joe Markey. And Mike and Shepherd. Mike Shepherd from the ESBC. I know that is so exciting. You know, I'm so looking forward to watching that school rise up and get filled and how it really takes off. Yeah. So I know they have their own show, but it's great they're coming on our show to kind of give us like a really quick, you know, here's where things stand. I really wanted to highlight, uh, take the opportunity to highlight all the collaboration that's taken place mm -hmm. with so many people on the elementary school building committee, mm -hmm. and it just felt really appropriate to have them here on this show. Right. All right. Now, before we get to them, so our first segment, there's been a lot of buzz about the football field. There has been a lot of buzz about the football field, Jim, and it really was a difficult beginning um, for our new athletic director, D. King. Mm -hmm. um, but she has been a dynamite fight force behind getting everything the way it needs to be. Yeah. Um, I should start this segment by saying that we are very excited that we will be having our first home home game, which is actually our third home game. Yeah. But we are playing our first home game on the field this coming Friday night at 7 o'clock. So we are delighted to be able to make that announcement. Um, but really, I wanted people to understand how much work had, that had gone into um, both preparing mm -hmm. for and the kinds of things that went into um, the repairs that yeah. had to be in place. But also I think important for, for folks to understand is that um, we've put measures in place to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Yeah, and honestly, that's what I really liked because when we sat down to talk about this show, you know, you said, look, People are talking about this. This is a big deal. Let's just get right into it and get an update mm -hmm. on how things went. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, we worked with some experts. Um, so that was great to reach out and get some advice. And working with, now that we're going into budget season, really thinking about what kinds of things do we need to put in place as we maintain all of our grounds, including mm -hmm. our playing fields. Um, to make sure that they're at the quality that we expect them to be for our athletes right. um, and for our community. Right. All right. So our, our own Mike Tarosian produced this segment. So let's see it. The high school athletic complex consists of 13 fields that encompasses over 20 acres. The irrigation system for the complex consists of five wells, 104 zones, and 520 sprinkler heads. Unless you've been traveling abroad, well, living under this rock, you know how hard it was this summer to keep your lawn green. More than half of Massachusetts is now experiencing an extreme drought. The U.S. Drought Monitor report of September 15th shows the area of extreme drought were limited to the northeast parts of the state, covering Essex and Suffolk counties and parts of Middlesex, Norfolk, Plymouth, and Bristol counties. On top of this weather, the school facilities department had some unexpected challenges to overcome with their athletic fields. In a September 14th report, Al Rogers, the Director of Buildings and Grounds, identified several well and irrigation issues last year and projected repairs through the FY17 budget process. As a result, two of the game fields were placed temporarily out of play for the beginning of the season. After identifying the problems with fields 3 and 10, these fields were placed on a prioritized watering cycle. Additionally, the fields were rolled, aerated, seeded, and fertilized. Within a week, the fields began to recover, but not to the extent that the district deemed acceptable for safe playing conditions. The home openers for the Hillers football and soccer were moved to other locations. As of last week, sports turf specialties assessed the fields and performed significant maintenance work to prepare for play this season. Additionally, more fertilizer was laid down and the field was aerated and rolled to soften the surface in effort to make sure it provided a softer landing zone for the Hiller athletes. 
Sports turf specialties determine the field to be playable for this week's football game against Norton. So I'm really looking forward to seeing a lot of you at the game on Friday night. Next, I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Carol Cavanaugh. Carol joined us in at the beginning of July, I guess, um, and already has just done so much for, for the community and for the, for the school department. So I wanted to have the opportunity when I learned about this show to really feature people that maybe people don't understand all the many things and varied things that they do. Um, but I thought we'd start by me asking you, you know, what are just some general impressions you have of Hopkinton as a school district um, in your role here as assistant superintendent? So in the past few months, I have, I think what stood out for me most markedly when I arrived is the level of professionalism here. I think from central office personnel to building principals, teachers, support staff, everyone maintains a demeanor that's very largely professional and at the focus of everyone's attention really is student learning. And so that has impressed me markedly. Um, I can share an anecdote with you. Oh, so this morning I met with a teacher who is relatively new to the Hopkinton Public Schools, not as new as I am. <laughs> and he did say to me that when he was in his previous di district um, and morale got low, the message that was sent to them all the time was, this is the way it is everywhere. Oh. And when oh. he arrived here in Hopkinton, he called his former colleagues and said, They've been lying to us. It's not the way it is everywhere oh, because wow. what he thinks he's found here is something Nirvana-esque. And I can, I can honestly say something similar, that um, it has been a pleasure working with people who are so professional and so devoted to education to children. And you know, that, that anecdote that you just gave is, is particularly powerful because it comes from somebody who's been in other districts. So often we have many, many people who've been here and always been here. Um, and it, all, it does feel when somebody is new to this district, I know that when I first got here, it felt like a different kind of place, something very special. In it. And I'm glad that you as a new person have pointed out that what's, what's so special is the focus on learning, student learning. Um, what is something that you have sensed, so obviously that's, that's a, a strength. Other general strengths that come to mind? Sure, so a few things. One is, um, despite the fact that this is a very high achieving district, you know, if you look at our standardized test scores, MCAS scores, all of those pieces, we are very high achieving. But I think that the professionals here maintain a kind of humility to say, where is it that I can continue to grow? Mm. And that is so important. You know, so when I meet with some of the building principals and we look through things like their watch lists and what we need to give individual children in order to make them better readers, writers, thinkers, mathematicians, those things are happening. And I don't think it's just with the principals. I believe that the teachers have that same kind of investment. So we really do, you know, even though adjustment to practice has been one of the district-wide goals, it's not just a buzzword. It's something that I think teachers and administrators and support staff, special educators, um, everyone really, really subscribe to. So can I just, I'm just curious. So what is your role, like, as you're meeting with them? Like, I know what, what Kathy does. She's, you know, the buck stops there, and she's running everything. So as the assistant, what, what do you do when you're meeting with these people? Um, I like to put that into the CIA acronym. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I am the curriculum instruction and assessment gal. So okay. um, very frequently we will look at assessment data. You know, where were the kids? Um, where are they now? And what do we think they need in terms of curriculum and instruction? So mm -hmm. that's, that's very largely the role that I play with building principles. And that doesn't sort of happen magically. You know, there are a lot of pieces, I think, that go into that. So, for example, if we see that, you know, students need a particular um, reading program, we do a lot of research about what it is that we want to bring into the Hopkinton Public Schools, why we've chosen that particular program, mm -hmm. what it's going to get us, and we know that there is no program that's perfect. So what might we need to augment that? What kinds of supplemental materials? And so those are really the kinds of things that I do. Mm. 
Um, additionally, I think that even though you may have these curricular programs, you need to ensure that teachers have the instructional repertoire mm -hmm. to get kids where they need to be. So, for example, one of our big goals has been to bring in self-regulated strategy development writing so that we can be sure that our kids are able to all write to informational text. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard so much about, like, uh, in our last episode, talking about getting ready for school and all these workshops and all these things going on. Um, it seems to me like there's just so much information, so much review, and so many programs that are getting started. It must just be a huge mountain of stuff that you're transmitting to the uh, staff. There is a lot of work to orchestrate professional development, mm. I think, for, um, for the five buildings. Um, I'm not sure the number of teachers we have in the district. You may know that. Close to 300 staff members. Yes, and they all have very disparate roles. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, some of um, the teachers may be, you know, art teachers, music teachers, special educators, mm -hmm. occupational therapists, physical therapists, and regular classroom teachers. So all of those people need very different kinds of professional development. Mm -hmm. So on a given PD day, we do an awful lot of work to arrange for it. Cool. And I'm glad, I think that's a really important thing that you point out, Jim, in terms of how much information there is. Because one of the things that Carol does so well is, is filter, right? So when there's so many things coming in, when there are so many initiatives that are, that are out there, um, what we want to make sure of is that teachers don't feel overwhelmed and administrators don't feel overwhelmed so that they cannot focus. Um, what's, what's a way in which you, you try to do that? Carol, with um, when you're planning professional development? So if we're doing professional development, I really like to try to keep it as focused for each individual person as possible. So for example, this year we have that SRSD writing initiative mm -hmm. and we are doing that at the Hopkins School and at the Middle School. And while it's something that the Center School and the Elmwood School have already been through and they're continuing to do that, um, for this year, we really have just kept our focus on, on that writing. Naturally, there are other things that are happening concurrently, things over which we have no control. So for example, in January, the state adopted new science standards. And there is a two-year period during which we are able to get our, um, our K-8 to kids to the place where the testing will eventually change in 2019. Mm -hmm. But I feel like we have plenty of time to do that, so we're not going to get ourselves nervous and anxious about it. We're going to take it one step at a time, but keep the focus on the writing for this year. Mm -hmm. So while we know it's there, we just don't want people to be highly anxious about it. Right. That's a great example. One of the things, another thing that you've spent already a lot of time on is, is really looking at um, our assessment results. And that means not just MCAS, which we're going to talk a, a little bit more about as well, but all of the assessment results that, that happen at the building level, you know, whether they're formative or summative or benchmark assessments, there's just so much data. What's something that you've discovered in terms of an area of need um, since, since you've had a chance to look at some of our data? So, and I guess I will look at um, our MCAS accountability reports, and I'll be talking to the school committee about this on October 6th. Um, in order to be a, uh, to have all of your buildings be level one buildings, you've got to ensure that not only are your regular education learners making the appropriate strides, but also high needs learners making the appropriate strides. And so some of what we're seeing is the need to, you know, infuse more uh, reading and writing into the elementary grades, especially among our high needs learners. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about high needs, the state categorizes those folks as children who have um, IEPs children who are not uh, who are English language learners and um, children who come from socio-economically diverse um, families okay. so so that continues to be an area that's that's been an area that we've been focusing on and has continued to be an area of need mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> definitely for the past many years yeah and speaking about MCAS and all those tests how like how high is the danger of um, what they say teaching to the test is where teachers just have to do that rather than going deeper. So well, I'm going to ask. Question <laughs> for you. It is a wonderful question, <laughs> and it's very interesting because, um, and I'm going to steal Alan Keller's words. 
Um, we were talking about the fact that the middle school had become a level one school. And that was very exciting for us that we had closed the achievement gap between, the, um, between all students and the high need students. Mm -hmm. So it was very exciting. And Alan had said that for a very long time he wrestled with the idea of should we teach to the test or should we just live with the idea that good high quality instruction is going to yield the results that we want. Wow. Mm -hmm. And he had never succumbed to teach to the test. And so, you know, kudos to the middle school, to the educators, to the parents, to the children who have gotten there just because the focus has been on teaching and learning mm -hmm. and not on, you know, we are going to sort of make ourselves slaves to a test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was really exciting, mm. and you know, I, I thank Alan I like, for his candor. Yeah, yeah. I like that answer. Mm. I'm sure he'll be watching. <laughs> um, the other thing I think that is pertinent with, with respect to this question is the changing um, nature of the way in which tests are posing questions. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, Carol has worked with the entire administrative team to give us examples of areas where students have struggled. Um, on the testing, on the standardized testing, specifically because it has required that we apply um, evidence of our understanding on a deeper level. Right. It's not just Q&A and memorization any longer. I wonder if you can just um, speak to that a little bit in terms of the new, the MCAS 2, for example, and what we can expect. Sure, so the MCAS 2.0 test, is going to be one where kids engage in what I like to call meaning making. Mm -hmm. So kids who had, in math for example, you know, a tendency to sort of follow an algorithm in the past. So we would give them a particular problem and they just, you know, sort of mechanically knew the steps. That has posed a problem in places where the current MCAS tests have infused some of those kinds of questions. Uh -huh. So when we look at the sample tests, we can see places where that meaning making needs, needs to happen. Um, so, um, what we're doing is we're looking at multi-step problems and places where we need to incorporate perhaps more writing in the math classroom. Right. Um, as an administrative team and even throughout the buildings, we have looked at a particular problem that gives kids a pictorial representation and then a mathematical equation uh -huh. representation. Yeah. And it doesn't ask them to solve, it asks them to talk about the relationship between those two things, I which see. is really very interesting. Well, that, that is really interesting. And I hope they can come back soon and talk more about this, because you got a really, really cool job. Oh, I do have the best job in the whole district. <laughs> Well, so our time again. has gone much too quickly, as I knew that it would. Um, if you want to learn more about all of the um, interesting things that Dr. Kavanaugh is talking about here, um, do tune in on the October 6th school committee meeting, where she'll be giving a full performance report to the school committee um, around all of the things that are all wonderful things that are happening in our schools. Um, and I want to thank you for being here. Well, thank you today. for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. you. And we will be back after a quick break with our next segment talking about the Elementary School Building Committee. Are you worried about letting your child take the wheel? Maybe you should also be worried about what you're doing behind the wheel. Have you ever sent a quick text just this once? Well, that might turn into a catastrophic accident. Monkey see what monkey do. If you do it, why wouldn't your child? In a child's brain, almost all things their parents do, they can do too. 78% of teen drivers' surveys text and drive. 59% said their parents do it too. Stop texting and driving, because if you do it, your child will too. Welcome back. I'm very pleased to introduce our next guest. Joe Markey is here with us this afternoon. He is the chair of the Elementary School Building Committee. And I just wanted to begin, Joe, before we get chatting, um, to point out to those who are watching that it's been, this is going on four years now um, that you've been chairing this committee. I know that because I joined the committee, you know, just as, a part, as an observer before I was even superintendent here. Right. Um, so I, I want people to understand how much has gone into leading up to the exciting event that we're about to have in town. Right. Okay, great. Thanks, Kathy, and happy to be here. And thank you, Jim. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to answer your first question <laughs> with, with a no. You, you can't have our set. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. So, you know, I'm also reminded at home of how long it's taken, right? Because, you know, when you have kids, their t sense of time is a little more aggressive, right? right? So they say, you want know, to go out to the meetings for the school building project. That you're still working on building it. When right. are you going to build it already? <laughs> just right. can't you just start building that it? That is so true. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, you, you know, uh, we, we did form, the, the selectmen and school committee formed this committee in early 2013. And wow. we assembled, this, you know, shortly thereafter. And uh, you started showing up as an observer and then yeah. as the new superintendent. Um, we're at an exciting point now, though, where we're through all the uh, design and development, design development, and uh, we're ready to do groundbreaking. So it's a very exciting time. That is so, and, and well, let's start with that. When is the groundbreaking going to be? So we're going to have a groundbreaking uh, ceremony on uh, Friday, October 28th at 10 a.m. at the site of the new school. Mm -hmm. So right next to between EMC Park and, and the site there. What the that official is address is 129 Hayden Row. Wow. Very So we exciting. invite the entire community to come out and celebrate with us. We want this to really be a celebration of all the community effort that went into this project because as you know it wasn't just you or I or our committee that did this but there were a series of workshops where we engaged the community as far as we could reach to get input yeah. into the design yeah. and the site selection and the development of the, right. the plan that we're now ready to start constructing again. So I know I've learned a tremendous amount by being on the committee and, and having never been part of a project this big. What have been some of the challenges as the chair? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's been a great experience. Uh, we have a very well-talented group of people who stepped up to volunteer and others who were assigned because of their office, but all have brought amazing experience and perspective. Uh, I'm proud as chair to say that we haven't had anyone leave the committee and, and revolt during this time. <laughs> so we've managed to kind of uh, storm and norm and, and move forward and mm -hmm. uh, stay together, which has been uh, great. And uh, we've got people with great you know, marketing and outreach experience, people who've like Mike Shepard, who brings invaluable experience on former school building mm -hmm. projects in town, mm -hmm. uh, others who bring architectural or other relevant experience. So uh, that's been great. Uh, I mean, we, we also have a great team, right? We, we got Compass we Project Management involved. They've been uh, uh, working with us. They've worked with many districts across the state to build schools before, so they know a lot of the, the pitfalls and things to avoid and how to help us move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, DRA, Dromi Rosane Architects, has been a great architectural design partner. Yes. And now, more recently, uh, working with Col Antonio for the construction. And getting all these teams to work together with the amazing uh, breadth and depth of their construction expertise mm -hmm. has been uh, fantastic. It's been that, that, I guess in terms of challenge, that is just a huge load of effort, right? right. All the reviews that the state requires and then that our local regulatory uh, process requires right. as well. Right. Uh, in fact, coming out of our extensive site plan review with the Planning Board and Conservation Commission, which concluded over the summer, uh, we then have to go into another peer review that's mandated by the state. Correct. So the number of consultants that have reviewed this and ensured that it, it uh, is designed properly has been uh, amazing. So yeah. just the volume yeah. of work. Well, I know I can just speak to being at the ESBC meetings and um, when you talk about the many people that are involved and, and I guess the um, the collaboration taking place around the table with all of the people that you're mentioning um, but the level of detail as well, when whatever it is that we happen to be discussing, whether it be the site planning or the tile yeah. or, you know, one of the things that they mentioned at a recent meeting was the naming. I mean, all of these things that go into a project, um, I think most people don't realize. Right, exactly right. So it's been great having you and Lauren, uh, Center School Principal Lauren DeVoe, Al Rogers, yeah. and we've learned each other's strengths to a point where depending on the topic that comes up, you know, if it has to do with uh, site facility maintenance or something, we know, you know, Al, yeah. double check this for right. us, what's your opinion? Yeah. Or I always turn to Pam Waxlax if there's a financial question right. or uh, to be resolved. So yeah, uh, yeah the, the level of detail, I mean, to the point of, uh, you know, in the planning board review, uh, we went in with one plan. We got some great feedback on, on, on the turning lane, the, the yes. length of the turning lane right. on Hayden Row. Uh, lots of discussion about signage, so you know people kind of take for granted that maybe there'll be arrows painted on the ground, 
or signs, and we had discussion about where should the signs be, where right. should the arrows be, right. and, and all of this has to be documented in architectural plans yes. before you start. And even as you're speaking about the signage, even the level of detail going into potential future planning, um, the great um, depth of conversation that went into the type of roadway, that would, the driveway would be, that could potentially support additional down the road um, b um, construction. Absolutely. And so I, I'm just that has been very impressive too. I wonder, um, because this has been new to me, just if you would comment on the partnership with the MSBA as well. Yeah, it's a great program really. So, um, uh, you know, it stems from the idea of providing good governance to towns t for their school building projects. I can't imagine doing this project without the level of professional expertise we have yeah. from the entities that the state requires us to work with. Correct. Right? They require that we hire a professional project management firm. Without this pro program or the involvement, we would be left as a, a, a bunch of volunteers without really direct experience trying to make these decisions. Right. The state, in exchange for the funding, the co-funding of the project, that they give us, you know, up to $14 million for this project. Yeah. Uh, they require you to do certain good governance practices like hire the project manager, hire a qualified architect that they get to review mm -hmm. and approve, and uh, several reviews and checkpoints along the way. And it really results in savings for the communities like Hopkinton who engage in the MSBA program. So again, savings because they uh, do it right the first we time. We do it right the first time. Yeah. So lots of time spent in the preparation and right. the planning so that when it comes to execution, you have it's fewer so issues ri rise up. Yep. If you think back into the history across Massachusetts, there have been districts before this MSBA program was set up where these, the spending and the over budget expense of the maybe they intended to spend this much on the school, yeah. but it ended up being two or three times that. That's true. This program is to prevent that situation okay. from happening. So I think the people of Hopkinton can be assured that because we engage in this program, we've proceeded in a very fiscally responsible That's, way. Thank you, Joe. That's such a that was a great explanation, and it's the Massachusetts School Building Authority. That's when right. When we talk about the MSBA, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're full of acronyms. We just throw yeah. it around. <laughs> yeah. So again, great. thanks for having me here, and I really do want to. Uh, make sure everyone is aware and helps us celebrate together as a community on October 28th, right. Friday, at the site of the new school, and 129 one, Hayden Row, 10 right, a.m. And, and that's right beside um, the entrance to e EMC Park, that's right? That's right. Um, yeah. I think another important comment just for you to make, for those families who are watching who maybe don't have kids in the school yet and have just moved to Hopkinton, when do we hope to open? We are on track to open for the school year that begins in the fall of 2018. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That, that feels like just around the corner. Right. That's excellent. And don't forget to keep up with the rest of what you're doing. They can, viewers can tune into your own show, ESBC Update. for. Yeah, that's latest. right. Every month we meet with Mike and ESBC Update. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right. So thank you, Joe, for being here. I look forward to seeing you at the next ESBC meeting. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching. We'll look forward to seeing you next time for Highlights from the Hill.